Um, as a geography student, that actually turned out to be really, really awesome because we got so many opportunities to work in an applied way that we never, ever would have gotten before those earthquakes. So I did three years of undergrad, got to the end of that, knew that I wasn't quite finished, so decided to come back for two more years and finished in 2015 with a master's degree in geography. <laughs> um, I started out post high school being really interested in the natural process side of geography. By the time I finished, the built environment was my thing. So I wanted to do more around how can we make cities better places for people to live and to work and to play and how, how can we make people's lives better through the built environment and geography. Um, I always knew I didn't want to be a planner. I had no interest at all in becoming a planner. So for me, it was about finding a way to turn that thing that excited me into something that could be a career and I could still learn and grow. So I'm in the monitoring and research team at the Christchurch City Council. I sat there today trying to figure out what to tell you about what we do and really in 10 minutes and really struggled because we cover a whole bunch of different topics, including the economy, communities, the natural environment, people, population, transport, and housing, and the built environment. And it's our job to collect information and data and turn it into insights and information and useful things that people like planners and policy makers and decision makers and engineers can use to make good decisions on how we use the city, basically. So. Um, I guess we're not scientists in your typical sense. We spend a lot of time playing with data, and if I had told 16-year-old Amy that she'd be in a job now where she spends most of her days playing with statistics, she probably would have laughed me out of the room. <laughs> so I'm going to take you just through a brief, brief overview of things that we collect and use about the city. So one of my key jobs is growth modelling. So we take information from Stats New Zealand about how the city's going to grow and what's been happening in the city in the past, and we turn it into things like maps that people can pick up and go, okay, here's what's happened. So here you can see the change in the city since 1886 through till 2000, and then one of my key jobs is to take information about future growth and turn it into things, again, that planners and policy makers and decision makers can use to develop a city. Um, one thing that we, we use this quite a lot because we want to provide good information that they can use to make good evidence-based decisions and hopefully prevent things like this from happening through good decision making about the built environment and planning rules. So we don't make the decisions, but we enable, hopefully, better decisions. Um, we collect a lot of information about how people use the city. So we take on students every summer, and this summer they went out and did some pedestrian counts for us, amongst other things, across the city. And we now can see how where people are and how they use the city varies across the day and the weeks. And we also have it at different times of the days. Um, we do a ground floor activity survey every year, so we go out and we collect information about what's happening on the ground floor of every frontage in the central city. That goes back to pre-quake, so we've got a pretty awesome data set now that shows how the city's evolved as we've gone through the earthquake recovery. We also collect opening hours, so information like this allows us to say, here's where people will be during the day and how they might be using the city, but also at night, where are those dark spots that people may feel unsafe and how can council make improvements to make the city a safer place where people feel more secure and that they would like to go. Um, we also collect a lot of information about people in the city. So we collect population, household, demographic information, how many people are coming to the city as visitors. Um, what else? Oh, we've got our own survey series, so Life in Christchurch, some of you may have seen it, so we collect a lot of secondary information from other sources, such as Stats NZ, but we also collect a lot of our own information, so it's, for us, it's about collecting that information, making sense of it, and then spitting it back out in a way that can be consumed by other people. It helpfully makes their lives a bit easier. Um, I would not be where I am without my geography degree. 
it gives you such a broad overview of a range of things that we we often get asked at work what we do and where we came from and all but one of our team are geographers but we generally tell people that we're generalists because we have to know such a broad range of things about so many different subject areas and we just get the most bizarre questions all the time. And that's, this sort of sums up where we <laughs> So let's remember that cities all over the world are growing, many of them very fast, that growth causes systems, failures, and social disarray when it is not planned for, but provides tremendous economic, social, and cultural opportunities when it is. Which one do we want? <laughs> I always remember in my um, environmental sciences degree, one of my um, more inspiring professors, he taught about parks. And he said, look, the best way to save wilderness is to make the cities a more pleasant place to live and a more pleasant place to be. Um, and I found that quite confronting at the time, but looking back um, and looking at sort of what Amy does and how, how Amy makes the world uh, just a little bit better, it does have a roll-on effect in um, the places that uh, Sophie so loves in the outdoors. So next, we have Cam, who is um, working now in the Department of Psychology here at U UC, and he's studying towards a bachelor's in science. You don't have it. No, I don't. I'll just get over it. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm a bit different than everybody else who has spoken tonight. Um, I'm actually still a current student here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I'm four weeks today away from graduating with my BSc. Um, and then from next semester on, I'll be enrolling in the first part of my master's degree in science. Um, but when I look back seven years ago, when I finished high school, this isn't where I expected to be, because after I left school, I actually went and trained as a graphic designer and did that for a few years, and then worked in the industry for a, a few more years. Um, and then I just decided that it was more of a hobby, wasn't for me, um, and I wanted to change. So I got every book, everything I could get from the university, all degrees. Um, and sat down and went through everything and decided what I wanted to do, which was psych. Um, I was going to make a funny pun about Freaky Friday, which is a movie, um, and I looked up when it was made, and most of you would have been three or just born. So I didn't think that was quite appropriate. Um, so when I came here, I initially started off in a double major doing psychology and linguistics, which are actually both... I'm, I, Pretty sure they're both in the College of Science and College of Arts. Um, but I ultimately decided to drop the linguistics and just stick with psych. Uh, it, mainly because after my first year, and you really, I, I actually took summer school before I started, so I did an extra course. So I could, as soon as I started, skip the first year of linguistics and go straight into second year, which was. Um, really good because it allows you to basically skip an entire year um, and still get the points. Um, but once I got stuck in, I found that I really love psych. Um, from one class, you're looking at child development. The next class, you're looking at, you're cutting open sheep's brains and learning anatomy. And then the next class, you're learning how to diagnose somebody with a um, psychiatric disorder. Um, but through my three years of my BSc, um, I've been given a lot of amazing opportunities, which have included becoming a research assistant um, here in the Department of Psychology. Um, and within that, I've also been lucky enough to be published in some of their work as an undergrad, which doesn't sound that exciting, but it is. Um, it's a pretty big deal. Um, but all the opportunities that I've been given while I've been here have definitely been come down to just getting involved in anything I can. Um, because when opportunity comes up, if you pass on it, it doesn't come back. Um, this year I've also become the vice president of UC Psych, which is the on-campus 
um, Psych Society. And then because of that and my history with design and marketing industry, um, I was a, I've been appointed on to the marketing committee for the department now. So I'm on that with uh, three of the office staff and about six of the academic staff. And so I help them with student outreach, um, planning events, um, keeping first years. Um, but um, so moving on from that, um, my master's project that I'll be moving into this coming semester um, all came up because I signed up to participate in an experiment that um, was being run by a lecturer, Catherine Thays, um, who's in the communication disorders department, which is another science degree. Do it, it's good. Um, and so it was for an MRI study. So you get to lie on the bed, go on the machine, have a brain scan. Um, so I was just lying there being a lab rat. Um, getting a free tumor check, thought, cool, cost them $1,000, nothing for me. Um, and I just happened to mention that I was interested in brain function and that I was going into my postgrad studies. Um, and she just told me to flick her an email, she might have a project that I'm interested in. Um, and as a result, she's now my supervisor. Um, and she's given me six months of extra training on how to analyze brains using um, a whole range of MRI scans. Um, and because of that as well, I'm also now part of the NZILBB, which is the New Zealand Institute of Language, Brain and Behavior, which is one of the largest multidisciplinary research groups on the university, uh, at the university, sorry. So it includes psychologists, linguists, um, communication specialists, uh, physicists, I think, um, engineers, a um, whole bunch of people. Um, um, so the project that I'm actually a part of is understanding the neural mechanisms of speech and people who stutter. So just a little bit of background, um, one in 20 children will develop stuttering and a large percentage of, that, of those children have it persist, uh, it persists into their adulthood. So um, in New Zealand now, there's about 33,000 adults that have stuttering and have to deal with all the challenges that come with it. And after decades of research, we still don't know what causes it. And therefore, we don't have a cure. Um, there was a prevailing theory in about the 60s that thought it was because of anxiety. Um, but we know now that that's actually a secondary behavior caused uh, from the bad experiences children have with language and then that feeds into itself and just creates a horrible cycle. Um, but we do know that it has a neural basis and has to do with brain structure and development um, as changes and differences have been found between those who have stuttering and those who don't. How it, however, it is unclear if these differences are causal or they're a consequence of the stuttering. So the overall project intends to unravel these questions for the very first time, it's never been done before, and to determine whether, uh, determine where in the brain these differences are and when they occur. Um, and my involvement specifically will be looking at a special type of MRI, um, which is called diffusion tensor imaging, um, which basically allows us to create a skeleton of all the white matter in our brain that connects all our speech um, centers together. Um, and then after we did that, the next step is to work with a researcher that's in Boston who created, who has created a computer model that can actually learn to speak. Now it's, it's not like Siri, you can't ask it to Google something and it won't call random on your phone, but we can teach it to speak like an actual human baby. It will learn to cry, it'll learn to coo, it'll learn to babble, it'll eventually get to single words and then full sentences. And then the fun part comes, we get to give it some brain damage. And we get to see what will make it stutter. Um, so this might have seemed like a bit of a ramble, but, and sound a bit odd that a psychology student is moving into um, work on stuttering, which is typically communication disorder. Um, but that's what's so great about science. So many disciplines overlap, we all share information and we all have the same goals, which is to make the world a better place. So if I can take all my psych knowledge and get involved with the communication department to find a cure for stuttering, then why not? That's 33,000 people in New Zealand and that's gonna help. Um, 
So a lot of you here tonight may not have a great understanding of where you're going to go or are undecided, but my advice would be to, like Logan said, take as many courses as you can. In my degree, I've taken psych, linguistics, Tereo, statistics, um, even some art history. Don't really know why, but um, but you have so much choice, and once you get here, you definitely learn that everything's not set in stone. If you decide in first year that you want to do chemistry or physics, and then decide actually no, I don't. I want to do statistics and math. Then all of that still counts towards it. You're not set in stone, and you really can do whatever the hell you want. Um, so. You, it's just up to you, really, to take every opportunity that comes your way and um, basically find out where your true passion lies because that's where you'll make the biggest difference. Thanks. Thanks, Cam. So um, our next speaker is Sylvia, and as she is coming up, um, we are going to do a little contest. So we have two packets of five tickets each to uh, the Crusaders versus, I don't know who, whoever they're playing weekend after next. Um, do you know who they're playing weekend after next? Oh, Chiefs, Crusaders versus the Chiefs. Um, so we have two envelopes full of five tickets each. Um, now, for anyone who would like to be in to win this, I uh, invite you to send one delegate down, down here. And what we're going to do is, um, amongst yourselves, um, you have precisely one minute to, um, like Cam was saying, decide or come up with an idea of how you want to make the world a better place. Um, and uh, what role science might play in that. Now, we're not going to give you long to speak. You've got approximately maybe four or five seconds each to say um, how you want to make the, the world a better place. Um, and so anyone who wants to be in to win the rugby, starting now, you have one minute to talk amongst yourselves to come up with your idea, send a delegate down, and then we will uh, do an applause meter to um, choose the two best ones. Okay, your, your one minute starts now. Just to clarify, the, the, um, it's the July 6th, and it's the Crusaders versus the Highlanders. You have 10 more seconds before you send down your delegate. Okay, anyone who wants to be in to win the uh, five tickets to the Crusaders versus the Highlanders on July 6th, send down a delegate. Delegates to the floor, please. And everyone else, Matthew is, is uh, showing us the way. We, we will do an applause meter a very scientific method of choosing the best one. Um, right, what's your name? Uh, Beta Singer. 
Veda? Yeah. How do you want to save the world? So I want to work on uh, sustainability in our oceans through the use of plastic eating enzymes. Um, oh, I'm Abby. I want to study medical physics so that I can use nuclear radiation in the hospitals to try and cure cancers and stuff. <laughs> uh, my name's Rudy. I would love to go back in time and be with you doing all of this again because this looks so exciting. And uh, I'd love to bring the world into the future with uh, Bitcoin and teach you all the wonderful things that maths can, what maths can do. I love maths. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Daniel and well, I just followed this right now actually. Uh, so I'm currently a bit nervous. I want to find a way using science to just, like try and help people when they're like nervous about something or getting like anxiety about speaking in front of people or something, you know, like that. Hi, I'm Josie, and I'd really like to find a way to make energy out of rubbish and clean up the waterways so that we can all have clean water, which is something that we're really running out of at the moment and will be very valuable in the future. Hi, I'm Cam. And I'd really like to think of something that can help our future, like keep, you know, our planet, you know, sustainable and stuff. Um, so something like, I don't know, global warming, probably. Yeah, because that, that's like a huge issue for us right now. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sasha. I'm really scared. Um, I think that. Um, it's not so much about doing something big and amazing that if you're happy in what you do and in your like, little bubble over and then you know, you're around other people and you s spread that love around, that makes the world a better place on its own. You don't have to do something amazing to be, do something great. Just doing something small can have a big impact, like the butterfly effect. Hi, I'm Olivia Silby. So um, in Christchurch we have trams, we also have a lot of congestion and um, a little bit of pollution here and there, so why not electric plant trams? Eases congestion, eases um, carbon emissions, saves the environment a little bit and more people going places where they want to go. Thank you, wow, okay, we will confer. This is a pretty tough one. Yeah, well. So this was really hard. We, um, uh, we thought they were all really, really good and everybody got a big clap, which was important. Um, uh, in the end, we only have two sets of tickets, so somebody had to win. Uh, and we thought the, the idea of uh, uh, Josie's was, which was to use waste for energy and cleaning up the water was great. So congratulations. <laughs> And we, we thought, um, as, a, as a philosophy on life, Sasha had a really good philosophy, which was to, which was to really just do what you love and do, sm do some small things and do them well. So yeah. you got the second prize. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thanks to everybody. That was really great. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm lucky last, don't worry, I won't keep you too long. 
Um, yeah, I'm Sylvia. I have my own company, Storm Environmental, uh, and I have a BSc First Class Honours in Ecology. Uh, I also have an MBA from, uh, with First Class from another university that we won't talk about. Um, and why did I choose science? Or well, more importantly, why did I not do more science? Because when I was at school, like most of you are, I actually did painting, and I did classics, and I did English. So this is my uh, year 13 painting submission, or part of it. Um, which is weird, because these days, I, uh, you know how to use a trench shield, and I supervise diggers. So it's a little strange. Um, how did I get there? This is my career journey. On the right is what I'm doing now, which is supervising large construction sites. And on the left is the circular route that I took to get there. So I did my uh, honours degree in science. And during my honours year, actually I was going to do journalism. I didn't even, almost, almost didn't even do honours. I was going to take a completely different route, but another story. Uh, someone approached me with a job and a consultancy. And I thought, why not? You know, I need a job. So I said yes, turned up on my first day. And it was a pretty horrific job, to be fair. I was sitting in a little office getting resource consents for dairy farmers to abstract water, which was not quite with my environmental ethos, but nonetheless, it was a job. So I stuck it out for a year and then went overseas with my uh, newfound skills to Edinburgh, where I lived for a couple of years and worked for another consultancy. Super easy to get a job because I had a, had a degree, a good degree and a year of experience. Came back to Wellington and got a sweet job at the Ministry of Fisheries for, on contract for five months, where I was reporting on uh, all the fishing in New Zealand waters um, to the, on behalf of New Zealand to all the international organisations that are involved in that. So that was fun, but it didn't last, and I had to go back to consultancy eventually. So I did that uh, to SKM and Jacobs, where I was a senior environmental scientist, and I did work in Vietnam and the Pacific and all around New Zealand looking at environmental problems, doing reporting on various environmental issues, which was great. Uh, it's actually, I missed out a circle in here. Somewhere in there I, had a, I started another little company which was making maps on microfiber for mountain biking, uh, which at the time I wouldn't have put on my career journey, but now I realise it was actually really important because it made me see how easy it is to start your own company. So I started Storm Environmental back in 2015 as a, uh, an environmental consultancy. And I currently work on contract to Christchurch City Council as a program manager. So what does a program manager do? Well, I used to be a project manager, which is when you uh, manage one or, one or more projects. A program manager manages project managers. So I currently have 18 project managers under me and they manage 92 projects across the city. And we're talking big money here, so this year we're spending 80 million, next year we're spending, I think, 54 million. And so most of my job at the moment is actually in the office. I go to lots of meetings and I make lots of decisions. Most of them involve millions and millions of dollars. Um, but they're pretty important decisions. Uh, and I also put cake on there because <laughs> it made it sound kind of serious. It's not. We have a lot of fun. And working in office sometimes sounds like a boring life choice, but there's a lot of banter, a lot of fun, a lot of uh, joy in my life. And this is some of my team looking over a fence, as we tend to do when we're on site and we're managing things. We're just checking it's all okay. How do I make a difference? Uh, I think that the position I've managed to get myself into in the 12 years since I've left uni, I'm now making a massive difference. So on the left-hand side there is one of the things we're building. It's out at Wigram. Um, in the background is Napunawai Sports Hub. And in the foreground is a large retention basin that's going to be a wetland. Um, that is going to stop people along the Heathcote River from flooding so they don't get flooding through their houses. And the wetland is going to treat the worst water quality in Christchurch, which comes out of Hayton Stream. So we're sort of two, two wins there, and uh, that's just one of our projects. In the middle is a picture of me in the Emergency Operations Centre during one of the flood events last year in July. So uh, that calls for some all-nighters. Um, I didn't do all-nighters at uni, I was a good student, but... I do do all-nighters in my job when people are flooding and, and scared and, um, and we go out there and, and comfort them and we do all the, the science to make sure that we know what's flooding when and where we, you know, we get asked by Red Cross, where do, where do we send the trucks, where do we send the help and we have to have that answer like right away. Um, in that moment, you really feel like you're making a massive difference and certainly the people that you talk to after those occasions tell you that you've made a massive difference. And on the right-hand side is some of the tree planting we do uh, with the community and some of our facilities. So this one's in Linwood, where we've built a 3.5 hectare urban wetland. 
Uh, so there's going to be a forest there, something like Rickett and Bush. Um, it'll obviously take a little while to grow because we only planted it last year, but nonetheless. So it makes a difference. Uh, what do I love about my job? It gets better and better. So that job I had out of uni was pretty average. And then the next job was a bit better, and the next job was a bit better, and now I'm actually at a job that's really sweet. Uh, but what's really funny is I mentor quite a lot of young people like yourselves, and I have heard this a few times, because you've all told your world changes and you need to do something amazing. It doesn't happen straight away. So people who have been at their job for four weeks, and they're like, I don't like this. I'm not changing the world. And you're like, you haven't worked out how to use the photocopier yet, you know, like, <laughs> start basic work up. <laughs> So it takes a while, don't just like expect instantaneous results. And I really loved what was said about little things adding up and making a difference. I think that's so true. Um, but what I specifically like, I've got three slides on what I specifically like, is getting to be outside, but not always. So when I was more junior, site visits were compulsory. I did quite a lot of field work. Um, straight after the earthquakes, I was in charge of the stormwater for the entire city. So I was on site all day, every day. Um, but these days, I only go outside when it's sunny. <laughs> oh, it's a nice day. I think I'll go on a site visit. Um, and so this is me on the, on the left looking at some earthquake damage and on the right supervising a digger going up a really, really steep slope, which was a fun day. That was in Littleton. Travel. So obviously uh, with my degree, I was able to go to Edinburgh and pretty easily get a job. That's my office mates. And um, on the left of the top is right down in Land's End where I was looking at some hydrology for a wind farm. And on the bottom left is a place called Tornagrain up near Inverness, right up the top end of Scotland, where I was looking at a land development there. So I got to go all around the place, um, and that was pretty fantastic. And sport, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the older uh, corporate sport and the fact that it's free and fun. So I was just sitting there before I made a list of some of the sports I did have done during my career so far, which is running, biking, netball, indoor soccer, Gaelic football, bug polo, volleyball, and touch rugby, all of which are free. So that's totally awesome. I totally recommend getting into consulting. Um, did I imagine I'd end up doing this? No. Uh, you could <laughs> No. Um, when I was at high school, they, used, they had this computer program that told you what career you should get into. And... Um, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. I like horses, so they thought maybe I could be in a quest. I don't know. Well, I don't know what they were thinking. It was wrong. Um, that's all I was going to say. Thank you. And before Sylvia sits down, um, I'll invite the, the rest of the panelists up, and it's time for questions. Um, Um, so this is a question for Sylvia. Uh, so you know how you said you did painting and stuff at high school? Uh, so what sparked the change from like more literature-based subjects to science? So why did I do painting and then end up doing science? I actually came to university and I started doing a double degree. So I was doing classics and science and biology. And I think I just decided that science was more fun. I, I enjoyed it more. And I actually did see that it was more practical. Like um, an arts degree is great, but it's kind of philosophical, whereas science, you're getting to the end point of doing something. Yeah. Other questions? So this is kind of related. What if you haven't studied science at upper high school, and then you want to do science at uni. Is that hard? Uh, I wonder if one of our course advisors would be best place to answer that. Or Matthew can answer that. Really good question. I mean, I think, I think in some disciplines it helps a little bit if you've got a bit of high school background in science, but there are plenty of the disciplines that we teach in the College of Science where you can, we, we teach things from the ground up. So, you know, geography, biology would be one of those cases. Um, uh, geology, to most, to most extent, doesn't really have any high school profile. Physics and chemistry, perhaps, you probably need a little bit before you came, but uh, most of our disciplines in, in science, you could, we, we teach it from the ground up. So if you don't have science background at high school, then, um, then come along and we'll, we'll get you started. Did you want to any other more questions? Yep. 
This is a question for the dude with the, uh, tra- I just don't remember your name, the guy, first guy with the traffic. Yes, I'm <laughs> sorry, I don't remember your name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you like say you monitor our traffic flow and stuff. Uh, how does that affect, do you do the um, the new project up near Auckland Way, how they're opening a new like road? To, uh, are you part of that? Oh yeah, maybe, I'm not sure. There's like a new traffic system. Probably Waterview, yeah. Um, yeah. Recently in Auckland, they did open Waterview Tunnel, I think about six months ago, and um, and so there will be a, a monitoring program that goes on that measures what are the traffic flows in the tunnel. Are they, as us modelers predicted, they would be? And I have seen some presentations that suggest that they are, um, although they were quite biased. Um, and... Uh, and they will also measure the travel times as well to see if there are benefits are what, what we're predicted to be too. So it's kind of interesting because it is so massive. Uh, I know myself having travelled to Auckland and, um, and and regularly gone from the CBD to the airport in a taxi, that Waterview Tunnel has made a massive difference to the congestion on, on the routes between the airport and the city. So, yes, yeah, interesting times. Um, also, actually, I should mention that um, later, speaking of transport, later in the week, is it tomorrow night or Thursday night? There's a, a Sarah, there's a tech night? Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Uh, uh, Tamsin can tell you about that. <laughs> uh, well, I know that my colleagues, some of my colleagues in geography are going to be talking about um, self-driving vehicles and their role in transport. And there will be other stuff there. Oh, there's a, there's a tech, tech Week night at the Ernest Rutherford building tomorrow night. It's from 5 to 8 p.m. So there's a, a range of presentations and demonstrations that you can see um, if you'd like to go to that. Have you got a question? Um, I got question here. The transport guy again. <laughs> Given. Um, what are you are you doing anything to make them more sustainable, like in terms of traffic systems or cars or? What? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, and I, I remember an architect being interviewed on on Saturday morning on RNZ recently. He said um, the and this was in relation to the accessible city um, when it was done, so a few years ago now. He, and he said um, it obviously stuck with me. The only thing traffic engineers are interested in doing is moving cars through uh, as fast as possible. Um, that could not be further from the truth. Um, the vast majority of traffic engineers and transport planners are are very conscious of um, alternative traffic modes and would like to do much more. Um, the, the, the issue being that, um, and Christchurch is a very interesting example, um, I'm almost tempted to do a show of hands, but I won't, um, but people love out their cars and they drive around in their cars and um, they are all um, single occupancy cars, so we do have to continue to cater for people who will drive their cars whilst encouraging um, people to get out of their cars onto bikes, into buses um, as best we can, and that means um, a gradual change over time, um, unfortunately. And the cycleways in Christchurch are, are kicking that off, and I'm looking at Amy, maybe she wants to to take that one and, and comment about um, the predicted effects of the cycleways, yes? So we actually do a transport survey once a year at work through the Life in Christchurch series and one of the questions we ask is how are people travelling to work, to education, to school, to social activities and we are seeing slowly but surely a growing increase in the number of people who are choosing to cycle and take the bus. So I think there's a big perception issue out there that there's not people using them, but in reality, the monitoring and the information that we're collecting are starting to tell a different story. So we're just watching and waiting to see what happens and how it develops. Got a question here? Hi, um, geology person, yes. <laughs> so when you were talking about um, going to like different places and where it's, there's not, not there, sorry, to sites where they're away from the city, can you go to like the city or 
when you're there, like when you're not working, can you move? Yeah. Sometimes there's a joke that goes around in geology that you stay in the best places and the worst places. So sometimes, yeah, you do stay in a in a central area, which could be a city. I've worked in Sydney quite a lot and lived in the city there working on large tunnelling projects. Um, but there's also been cases like, for example, when I was working in West Africa where there just aren't the facilities to put you up anywhere remotely close to what we would be used to in the Western world. Um, and so you might end up spending quite a bit of time in, in a tent or a shack or a porticom. But that's what makes it fun. No, you oh. don't get to choose. I mean, well, you, you, do, you do get to choose whether you, you know, participate in the project or not. Hi, this is for anyone really, but if by the time you get to uni, you don't know what science you want to study, but you know you want to study a science, how would you go about finding out which one fits you best? Oh, well, I could probably answer that as well, because that's exactly what I did. Um, I took a find myself semester where I just took everything that interested me, and it might seem like a long period of time to spend six months or a year trying to work that out, and you're paying for it, but... Um, Somebody said it's, it's worth, all of those will input into the greater picture of what you understand and then you can actually go into choosing what you want to do with a little bit more of an idea. And these guys can help you. And I might add that now you're not paying for that find yourself year. Oh, God, you guys are lucky. <laughs> Were there any other comments? I think... The key thing is to not panic. You're going to get asked so many times, what do you want to do when you leave school? What do you want to do when you finish uni? And you don't have to have all the answers. It's about taking that time, like Sophie said, to actually find out what does interest you and what you want to spend your time doing. Now, With the first year free, you could, uh, the parents in the room might not like this, but you could spend your first year finding yourself and then you do your degree. <laughs> Or, <laughs> um, so ideally all of you will have a member of our liaison team come to your high schools, probably for between August and October in your last uh, year at school. Take the advantage to go to them and talk to them about what you would like to put in your degree. When you put your enrolment in to come to Canterbury, we regard it as a placeholder. Effectively you're saying, I'm intending to come. When you come in your first couple of weeks, you're going to be bamboozled with information, new sites, new experiences, new ways of learning. But within that two weeks, you can change any of your courses without financial penalty, even with fees free. Okay? And we encourage people, if your friend comes to you and says, go to Antarctic Studies, go and sit in on a couple of lectures. It might be something you've never considered, but it could be something you really enjoy. So one of the things is taking that time in that first two weeks of each semester to try different things that people might say they're really enjoying, and then you can change your enrolment and there's no effect on anything, okay? So one of the things is just check up on the fees free because there are specific qualifications around it, okay? So spending a year finding yourself sounds like an awesome time. I went overseas and did it and Chernobyl blew up, which wasn't ideal. But it's probably cheaper to not do it at university right now. Um, it wasn't my fault that Chernobyl blew up. Um, <laughs> It's just in close proximity. Um, so I think one of the things is, once you're here, listen to people you meet. And if you go, someone says, Anne is an awesome lecturer, go and sit in on one of her lectures because actually, if you have a lecturer who engages you, you will learn better, you will enjoy it. But the key thing is, Bingu and I, basically we can put a degree together from pretty much anything. Um, and so come and see us if you want to talk about it. If something's not feeling right, come and talk to us and we can give you suggestions, other ways of looking at your major. We know how, what the degree requires and we can actually help you make a really cool plan that can probably pack quite a lot more into it than you think. Does that answer anything? Got a question here. Yeah, this is to the traffic guy. <laughs> traffic guy. Um, are any of your traffic management plans or whatever that you come up with, are they ever like a failure? So 
not what you're expecting it to happen? Oh man, these are good questions. <laughs> so the question, I don't know if you all heard it, was uh, any of the traffic management plans, not ones that I personally come up with, are they, are they ever a failure? Um, and yeah, um, that does happen and actually one of the things that I get involved in is um, analysing how good or bad traffic management plans, so roadwork sites go, and we had one Oh, I suppose I can talk about this. Um, out in Sumner recently where they were, um, well, it was an interesting job. They, they had a, a tree um, that was um, old and rotten or something and it's sitting on top of Clifton Cliff and they had to lift it down off piece by piece. They can't just bowl it or let it fall over with a crane. So they parked the crane and they were supposed to do stop go, you know, the stop go paddles. Um, but what they actually did was stop, stop. Uh, and um, and so that while they were lifting this tree down, they were stopping all the traffic coming out of Sumner, and we had people stuck in Sumner for an hour, and uh, actually saw a, what we call in the council a customer service request, a CSR, which is basically a complaint, and someone missed a flight um, because they, they hadn't allowed for this. So that was an example, and we, we pulled in the contractor and, and sort of taught them free, but they were effectively going against what they were actually allowed to do. So yeah, it happens and that's an interesting question. That's a really good question because I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't think you can, sorry. Oh, the question was, where would I be if the work case hadn't happened? Um, I really don't know. I, I was still in Wellington enjoying my job there. I guess I would have become more senior in my company there, but probably wouldn't have been as exciting. So, yeah. <laughs> like a job interview. <laughs> she asked where we'd be in 10 to 15 years. Someone else can answer that. Oh. <laughs> um, well, for me, I will hopefully be a clinical psychologist, so working in a hospital, um, likely. But, yeah, I still won't finish studying for another six years, so still a wee while away, but, yeah. Uh, for the next 10 to 15 years, I hope to just get in, involved with a range of interesting projects and just continue to grow my knowledge and enjoy it and have fun and um, hopefully mentor and inspire other young people to do the same. I am three years out of university and at this point I can honestly say I don't know and I'm actually okay with it. I think as long as I'm enjoying what I'm doing and taking opportunities as they come my way, that's all I can do at this point. You all did receive um, a red pack of um, goodies. And in there, you'll find information about um, uh, what we do here in in the college um, and uh, a couple of uh, some of the degrees. There's uh, flyers about the different degrees outside. And um, if there are no more questions, I'll bring the evening to a close. But um, Matthew and I and the um, course advisors are here if you have any more very specific questions. Thanks very much for coming along. And we look forward to seeing you.